Hey guys, welcome back to the Dead Church series. Throughout this series, we've been looking at what real Christianity looks like according to the Bible, and how modern Christianity does not look at all like what the Bible says real Christianity should look like. If you're new to this series, I highly suggest you start at the beginning of this series and work your way through because all of these videos are building one on top of another. You can find the link to the entire playlist right here. Throughout this series, we've been talking about what real Christianity looks like. It's important that we know what real Christianity is. It's important that we know what Jesus and the apostles said real Christianity is. It's important because we need to know if we're really followers of Jesus or not. We don't want to be people who are deceived. We don't want to be people who think we love Jesus only to hear him tell us that he never knew us. We don't want to find out when it's too late that we were never God's children. The Bible warns us that it's possible to be deceived. Peter tells us, My brothers and sisters, make every effort to be certain that you really are called and chosen by God. Peter tells us to make every effort to be sure that we really are God's children. Why? Because it's possible to think that you're called and chosen by God when you actually aren't. He's telling us to take this seriously. He's telling us to not wait until judgment day to find out for sure. If you just accept what you've always been told by the church, even though the Bible tells you outright that the church is going to be full of false teachers and people will be deceived, are you making every effort to be certain that you really are called and chosen by God? If you just accept what they say, despite all the warnings, are you really trying hard? Are you doing what Peter told you to do? Protestants teach that you can have assurance of salvation as long as you're sure that you believe the information is true. Protestants think they're doing what Peter said to do when they test themselves against their own theology, theology they received from men. They think they're examining themselves against Scripture when they examine themselves against what people have told them Scripture says. They listen to a man's teaching first, and then they look at the Bible to see if that man's teaching is true. They look at individual Bible verses taken out of context. They follow that man's logic, looking at all the verses he quotes, and they're convinced by his arguments. They end up believing what that man said, and they think they believe what the Bible says. But they didn't start with the Bible. They didn't look at the Bible as a whole, as one cohesive message to see what it teaches. No, they just followed someone's reasoning. And because that person quoted some Bible verses, they think they're teaching the truth. Paul said about these teachers, they want to be teachers of the law, but they do not understand either what they are talking about or what they so confidently assert. Okay, Paul is saying they want to be teachers of the law. That means they want to be teachers of Scripture, but they don't understand what they're talking about. In other words, just because someone is teaching from the Bible doesn't mean they're teaching what the Bible says. The Pharisees taught from the Bible too. Did they teach the truth? Peter warned us that false teachers will twist and distort the things that Paul wrote, as well as all of the other scriptures. That means they are teaching from the Bible. Therefore, just because they tell you that the Bible says something and they can use Bible verses to back it up, it doesn't mean that's what the Bible actually says. So many Christians believe the lie that, oh, we have to go to a church that, that preaches the Bible. They preach the Bible. It's a Bible-preaching church. We only preach the Bible. We only preach the Word. But they're not. 
They are reading Bible verses and then they're preaching their own ideas and they're telling you that those verses say the same thing they're saying. But most of the time that's not true. Just because people quote the Bible does not mean they are preaching the Bible. And you need to be the one who has the wisdom and understanding to see past it. You are the one who is going to be held accountable on Judgment Day whether or not you obeyed Scripture. You are not going to be held to the standard of what your pastor told you or what some preacher told you. If you don't start with the Bible, beginning there, ignoring and rejecting all of man's teaching in order to know for sure what the Bible itself teaches, then when you read the Bible, you're going to read it through the lens of what you were told it says. You'll be convinced that you're following what it says when you're really just following what you were told it says. You'll read scripture and you'll think you're following scripture, but you might be missing the whole point of what it actually teaches because you'll read it through a lens that distorts what it's actually saying. You'll think it's saying something it's not. So here's my point. When Peter tells us to make every effort to be certain that we're called and chosen by God, we have to start with the Bible. We have to be certain that our lives are in line with what the Bible actually teaches, not just in line with Protestant theology, not just in line with what some man teaches, even though they claim that the Bible backs up their theology. Protestants teach that you can be sure that you know God if you believe in the gospel, accept Jesus into your heart, and trust in him for salvation. They say that as long as you believe all of the correct information, you can have assurance of salvation. Many people think they've made every effort to be certain that they're called and chosen by God because they've asked themselves, do I really believe in the gospel? Do I trust in Jesus for salvation? And then when they decide that, yes, they do believe and yes, they do trust, they find themselves sure that they do truly know God. But that's not what the Bible says. That's just what men have told us the Bible says. And people think it's what the Bible says because then they hear the man's teaching and then they read the Bible through the lens of what they were taught. They didn't start with the Bible. Here is what the Bible says. We can be sure that we know God if we obey his commands. Okay, Peter tells us to make every effort to be certain that we are called and chosen by God. John tells us how. If we obey God's commands, we can be sure that we know God. Okay, if you want assurance of salvation, you must look at more than just what you believe, think, and feel. You must look at your actions. Is your life defined by the things God says it should be defined by? Does your life match scripture? Or does your life match the lifestyle of the Christians around you? The Bible tells us the church will fall away. That means our lives must match scripture even when it doesn't match all the Christians around us. John is telling us how to be sure that we know God. And by telling us this, he's also telling us how to recognize true Christianity from false Christianity. The Bible describes Christians as selling their possessions. They were sharing everything they owned with one another. They didn't consider anything to belong to themselves. There was no one in need because everyone looked out for one another rather than themselves. They lived that way because that's what Jesus taught. That's what the commands of God are all about, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. The church today doesn't look like this. Even the Christians who try to live in love don't live like this. 
They do ministry. They serve others. They buy meals for homeless people. They help drug addicts. They tell people about Jesus. And they do various other good deeds. But then they go home to their comfortable American lives. They go back to watching TV. They go back to buying stuff for themselves. They don't share everything in common with one another. They don't make sure that there are no needs whatsoever in the church. They don't live in total equality with their brothers and sisters like Paul said we should. Their ministry doesn't define their entire lives. It's just something they do sometimes. That's not what the early church looked like. They didn't look that way because that's not what it means to obey Jesus. Jesus said the world will know that we're his disciples by seeing our love. John said that anyone who loves has become God's child. So if the way we're loving is no different than many unbelievers love, then that's clearly not the right kind of love. And many unbelievers do humanitarian things. Many unbelievers feed the homeless. Many unbelievers help drug addicts. Many unbelievers help people in need. Doing some good deeds is not what will separate us. Doing some good deeds is not how to identify true Christians. The modern church doesn't know how to evaluate whether or not they know God because they don't even know what God's commands are. They've made up their own standards and then measured themselves by those standards. They're not concerned about the fact that the book of Acts describes the first Christians living a lifestyle radically different than anything we see today. They consider themselves as obeying God, even though they don't do what the early Christians were doing. Throughout the entire New Testament, Jesus and the apostles were warning us that the church would fall away. They were warning us that Christians would be deceived. They warned us that the church would be full of people who think they know God, but they don't obey his commands. Earlier in the series, we talked about apostasy. In the Old Testament, ancient Israel was warned by Moses that they were going to rebel against God. They were told they would become apostate. They were told they would abandon God. They were told they would fall away. And it didn't take long for those warnings to come true. They fell away. They abandoned God. They became apostate. They painted the picture for us of what it looks like to become apostate. But it's not what most Christians expect. During the height of their apostasy, Israel is described as bringing sacrifices to God as worshiping him, celebrating the feasts and Sabbaths, meeting together, raising their arms in prayer to God, seeking God, delighting in God, drawing near to God, fasting, bowing their heads to God, reading scripture, prophesying, listening to prophecy, and eagerly anticipating and watching for the day of the Lord. Quite frankly, the biblical description of apostasy is the modern description of the church. This might upset some people, it might offend some people, but it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us because just like Moses warned Israel that they would become apostate, Jesus and all of the apostles warned the church that Christianity would become apostate. It's the single biggest warning found throughout the New Testament. It's not a warning you can just ignore. And yet most Christians just ignore it. They don't pay attention to it. They don't give any thought to it. And so then they don't recognize that the apostasy has already happened and they join the apostasy and they don't think about the fact that the Bible says the church is going to become apostate. 
The implications of the church becoming apostate is that you can't just assume that the Christianity around you is true Christianity. It's not the biggest warning in the New Testament for no reason. It's not something you can just ignore. You are being a fool if you just ignore it. Furthermore, the New Testament doesn't just tell us that the church would become apostate. It tells us when it happened. Paul dealt with false believers all throughout his lifetime. But he warned us in Acts 20 that the apostasy was really going to take off after his death. He said, I know that after I am gone, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even some from your own group will rise up and twist the truth and will lead away followers after them. So be careful. Paul is warning us that something big is coming and it's going to happen after his death. Paul is saying that after he dies, wolves will come in and twist the truth and lead away followers after them. He's saying, be careful. All throughout the New Testament, he's warning us that apostasy is coming, but here he's saying it's coming after he is gone. That means after he is dead, after Paul dies, this apostasy he wrote about through all his letters is coming. Peter wrote similar warnings shortly before he died. Second Peter chapter 2 is an entire chapter warning us about the apostasy that will soon fill the church. Okay, Peter wrote this shortly before he and Paul were both killed in Rome. Paul and Peter both died around the same time in the mid to late 60s of the first century. Again, Paul had said that this apostasy was coming and that it would begin after his death. And in the book of Jude, we can see Paul's warning coming to life. The book of Jude was written within, at most, just a few years after Paul died. And Jude starts off the letter by saying, Dear friends, I was just about to write you about our common salvation, but I felt the need to write you about something else. I want to urge you to defend the faith that was given to the holy people of God once and for all time. For some people have wormed their way into your group. Long ago, the prophets wrote about these people who will be judged guilty. They are against God and have distorted the grace of our God into immorality. The entire remainder of the book is about false believers. The entire book is warning us to not be deceived by these false Christians all around us. So look at the timeline. Paul said the apostasy was going to happen after his death. Then, within just a few short years after his death, Jude writes a letter. In his letter, he says he was going to write about something else, but he changed what he was going to write about because he felt the need to address a bigger issue. That issue? Apostasy. Jude wrote his letter because something big had just happened in the church. His entire letter is about false believers. People who are in the church calling themselves Christians, yet refusing to obey the commands of God. He describes them as dirty spots in your fellowship meals. They eat with you and have no fear, caring only for themselves. Jude shows us what was going on shortly after Paul's death. Something big had just happened. The apostasy that Paul and Peter had warned us about suddenly arrived. 
It was so sudden that Jude changed what he was writing about because it became such an urgent issue. And he reminds his readers that the apostles told them this was coming. He says, Dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ prophesied. They said to you, in the last times, there will be people who laugh about God, pursuing their own evil desires. These are the people who divide you, people whose thoughts are only of this world, who do not have the Spirit. Jude is saying, guys, don't forget that you were warned about this. You were warned by all of the apostles that this was coming. That's what we see in the rest of Scripture. We see warning after warning after warning that apostasy is coming. And Jude is saying, guys, don't forget that you were warned about this. The apostasy has arrived. Don't forget that the apostles told you this was happening. Don't be led astray. Don't give in. Don't become one of them. You were told this was coming. Don't be deceived. Jude isn't our only indication that something major changed shortly after Paul and Peter and many of the other apostles all died. The letter we know as 1 John was written by the Apostle John to address apostasy. He wrote it roughly 10 to 20 years after Paul and Peter died. His entire letter is written to tell Christians how to recognize true Christians from false Christians and how to avoid falling into apostasy themselves. He says, My dear children, these are the last days. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and now many Antichrists are already here. This is how we know that these are the last days. These enemies of Christ were in our fellowship, but they left us. They never really belonged to us, for if they had been a part of us, they would have remained with us. But they left, and this shows that none of them really belonged to us. Remember what Paul warned us about. He said that after his death, wolves would come in and attack the flock. He said people who were in the church would rise up and lead others away. And here, within 20 years of Paul's death, John is saying that this has already happened. People who were part of the church had risen up. They had led people away. John calls them antichrists. And he proceeds to warn us that these antichrists are trying to deceive us. They are teaching lies. They are leading people astray. He says, I am writing these things about those people who are deceiving you. The rest of John's letter is teaching us how to recognize true Christians from false Christians. Paul said the apostasy would happen after his death. Shortly after his death, Jude felt an urgent need to write about false Christians in the church. Shortly after that, John wrote about how people had fallen away from the truth and were deceiving others and leading people astray. The apostasy happened right when Paul said it would happen, shortly after his death. The apostles all warned us that it was coming. They warned us that it wouldn't just be a few people here and there. It would be big. Paul told us in 2 Timothy 3 that the times would be terrible because the church would be defined by apostasy rather than by true love. When we look at the church today, we need to remember that this is what we're dealing with. It's not the same church we see in Acts. It's not the same church we see in Paul's letters. Something changed. People stopped following the truth. They stopped obeying the commands of God. Just like Israel in the Old Testament, the church today is full of people who come to God, sing songs to God, pray, raise their arms, bow their heads, fast, draw near to God, have holy meetings, and read scripture. 
Just like Israel in the Old Testament, Christians today think they know God. They claim God is with them. They prophesy in His name. They say they know God. But they don't obey His radical commands that would cost them everything important to them. That's what the Bible says apostasy looks like. Throughout this series, we've been looking at how this apostasy happened. We've talked about how the church has replaced biblical teaching with human tradition. We've seen how Christians have brought their own definitions and redefined what Scripture is teaching by using their own definitions instead of biblical definitions. The Bible tells us that many people who think they are Christians will be deceived. They will follow false teachers. They will be led into destruction. They will expect to hear Jesus say, Well done, good and faithful servant. But they'll end up hearing, I never knew you. Depart from me. Since the Bible warns us that the church will become apostate and many Christians will be deceived, it's important that we understand the difference between true Christianity and apostate Christianity. It's also important that we recognize the biblical implications of apostasy. As Peter said, it's important that we make every effort to have assurance of our own salvation. But it's not just about our own salvation. The Bible also says that it's important that we recognize the difference between true brothers and sisters and false brothers and sisters. A lot of Christians, even after recognizing that something is wrong with the church today, still think that anyone who calls themselves a Christian and believes in Jesus is in fact a Christian. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches us what true Christianity looks like. It tells us that it's a radical lifestyle. It costs everything. It changes everything. It reprioritizes everything. It also teaches that anything short of this is not Christianity at all. Those people are deceived. They're headed toward destruction. They're following the Antichrist. They are dead. Jesus called the church in Sardis dead. He told them that if they didn't change, he would come as a thief in the night against them. By saying this, Jesus was telling them that they weren't actually Christians at all. This is because, as we've been discussing throughout this series, true Christianity changes the way you live. True Christianity is about whether or not you obey Jesus. It's about doing the things Jesus directly said to do. It's about living like the early church in Acts. True Christianity is about action, not merely belief. Therefore, if someone doesn't have the correct actions, they are not really a Christian even if they say they are, even if they think they are. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets. They come to you disguised like sheep, but they are really dangerous like wolves. You will know these people by their fruit. Grapes don't come from thorn bushes, and figs don't come from thorny weeds. In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. Every tree that does not produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In the same way, you will know them by their fruit. Not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do what my Father in heaven wants. In this passage, Jesus is saying that you can know whether a person is a sheep or a wolf based on their fruit, whether or not they do what God wants. He says you can know whether a person is a good tree or a bad tree based on their fruit, whether they obey God or not. 
most Christians today think Jesus is lying. Obviously, they wouldn't put it in those words, but they prove it's true because they're incapable of identifying true Christians from false Christians. They think it's impossible to identify someone by their fruit. They think the only way to identify a true Christian from a non-Christian is based on whether or not that person calls themselves a Christian. Furthermore, they think that everyone who says they believe in Jesus is truly a Christian. Why? Because they've accepted a gospel that says you're saved by believing the information is true, not by obeying it. They've accepted a Christianity that says it's all about what you think and believe, not about what you do and whether or not you obey. Christians look at themselves and all the other false Christians around them. They see a lot of bad fruit mixed in with what they think is good fruit. And they reject what Jesus said. Jesus said a good tree can't have bad fruit. And he said a bad tree can't have good fruit. Well, obviously Jesus was wrong. Good trees are bearing some bad fruit. Jesus said they would bear no bad fruit, but clearly when he said no, what he really meant was slightly less than others. By redefining what Christianity is, Christians have made it impossible for themselves to identify a tree by its fruit. When they read this passage, they choose their own theology and their own idea about what it means to be a Christian over what Jesus actually said. They reject what Jesus said for the sake of their own doctrines and theologies. In order for the church to grow into maturity, Christians need to start recognizing the difference between those who say they love God and those who do love God. If you love me, you will obey my commands. Those who have my commands and obey them are the ones who love me. If people love me, they will obey my teaching. Loving God means obeying His commands. In order for the church to grow into maturity, Christians need to stop thinking of apostate Christianity as a real viable option. This means they also need to stop thinking of apostate Christians as real, true brothers and sisters. The Bible tells us what real Christians look like. It tells us what the fruit should be and how to recognize true believers from false believers. Christians need to start accepting the Bible's definitions. Jesus tells us that we can identify who is truly a Christian and who is not based on the fruit in their lives. Why? Because those who truly love Him will obey Him, and only those who obey Him actually love Him. Therefore, if someone is not obeying His commands, His radical, extreme, costly commands, then that person isn't really a Christian, even if they think they are. Ancient Israel thought they followed God, but they were apostate. The Pharisees thought they diligently served God, but they were hypocrites. The church in Sardis thought they were alive, but they were dead. The New Testament warns us that the church as a whole will be deceived, thinking they're on the narrow road to life, but really being on the broad road to destruction. Only those who obey Him actually love Him. Not everyone who calls themselves a Christian is truly a Christian. Or as John said when he was addressing the apostasy of the church, So if we say we have fellowship with God, but we continue living in darkness, we are liars and do not follow the truth. Anyone who says, I know God, but does not obey His commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in that person. 
Anyone who claims, I am in the light, but hates a brother or sister, is still in the darkness. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Those who do not practice righteousness are not God's children, and those who do not love their brothers and sisters are not God's children. Whoever does not love is still dead. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. If people say, I love God, but hate their brothers or sisters, they are liars. Those who do not love their brothers and sisters whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have never seen. Repeatedly, John is telling us how to recognize true believers. It's not based on what they say, think, believe, or feel. It's based on what they do. Do they obey God's commands or not? Do they love, not loving with the world's love, but loving with the radical love of Jesus? John says you either love others radically with the extreme love of Jesus that completely forgets about yourself and only looks out for the good of others, or you hate. There's no in-between. If a Christian is only loving with the same kind of love the world has for others, it's the same as hatred in God's eyes. John is saying the same thing Jesus said. You can identify a tree by its fruit. If someone isn't obeying the commands of God, it doesn't matter if they say they love God. It doesn't matter if they think they love God. It doesn't matter if they feel strong affection for God. It doesn't matter if they believe all the information. It doesn't matter if they say they know God. It doesn't matter if they themselves are fully convinced that they're Christians. If they don't obey what God says to do, they're still dead. They're still in darkness. They don't follow the truth. They are not God's children. They don't know God. This is how we're told to identify true Christians from false Christians. This is how we recognize someone by their fruit. True Christians need to stop thinking that everyone else who calls themselves a Christian is truly a Christian. They need to stop thinking that just because someone thinks they're doing something for the Lord, that it's what God wants. However, it's also important that we recognize something else. Every Christian who grew up in church knows that we're not supposed to judge others. We all know that we need to be careful not to judge others. We're all familiar with Jesus' words, don't judge others and you will not be judged. So obviously it's important that we don't judge others. We need to make sure that we go through life not judging other people. And this is something that a lot of times when we talk about recognizing fruit and knowing who's a Christian, who's not, a lot of people are like, whoa, 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 you've got to be careful not to judge. And yes, it's true, we've got to be careful not to judge. But let me ask you, do you know what that verse means? Or do you just assume you know what it means? Do you know what Jesus means when he says judge? Or do you bring your own definitions and assume that he's talking about the same thing you would be talking about if you said what he said? Based on what you understand about this verse, would you say it's right or wrong to judge the church? Many Christians say, be careful not to judge the church. You can't judge the church. Is that what Jesus is saying? Is Jesus saying we shouldn't identify fruit? Is he saying we shouldn't look at someone's actions to determine if they're following the Lord? Most Christians are so quick to look at this verse and say, be careful not to judge the church. You can't judge the church. But Paul actually says the complete opposite. He says it's our responsibility to judge the church. He says, It is not my business to judge those who are not part of the church. God will judge them. 
but you must judge the people who are part of the church. You must judge the people who are part of the church. That's what Paul said. Christians tend to get a verse stuck in their head and they don't even understand it. What's worse, they build their lives around it and teach it to others. As Paul said, they want to be teachers of the law, but they do not understand either what they are talking about or what they so confidently assert. When Jesus told us not to judge others, he wasn't saying that we shouldn't evaluate fruit. He wasn't saying that we shouldn't look at whether or not someone obeys God in order to know if they're real Christians. And he wasn't saying that we shouldn't judge the church. It's our job to judge the church. I've heard pastors and many Christians talk about how we shouldn't judge the church because the church is the bride of Christ, the temple of God. They say that judging the church is like trying to tear down the temple of God. But here's the problem. If the church is apostate, then it's not the temple of God. If the church is full of people who look like this world and don't obey the commands of God, then according to Scripture, they are dead. And if they're dead, they don't have the Spirit living in them. And if they don't have the Spirit living in them, then they're not the bride of Christ and they're not the temple of God. When Jude warned us about the false believers that were going to fill the church, he said, they do not have the Spirit. If they don't have the Spirit, then how are they God's temple? One Christian teacher has said that if you judge the church, it would be the same as if you went to the temple of Solomon right after seeing God's glory fill the inner sanctuary and you started hitting it with a sledgehammer to tear it down. That is not what we're talking about, because we are not talking about judging the church during the time of the apostles when the church was walking in the commands of God and filled with the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the church during a time of apostasy. Or in other words, going back to the analogy of the Temple of Solomon, we're not talking about the day God's glory filled the inner sanctuary. We're talking about the temple during the time of the prophet Jeremiah. During the time of the prophet Jeremiah, who were the ones saying you cannot speak against the temple of God? It was the false prophets. It was the apostate people. It was the ungodly priests. Jeremiah was the one who was proverbially taking a sledgehammer to the temple of God. He was telling them that God was going to destroy the temple and burn the entire city to the ground. The ones telling him to stop were the ones who were headed to destruction. They thought Jeremiah was blaspheming God's holy temple by saying the temple would be torn down. They tried to kill him for saying it. That's what Christians are doing today when they try to stop people who fear God from judging the church. They think they're defending God's temple, but they're actually opposing God. What ended up happening to Solomon's temple? It was torn down. It was burned to the ground. All of the treasures and holy things in the temple were carried off to Babylon and placed in the temples of false gods. Jerusalem was demolished. The entire land was left desolate. The Old Testament refers to it as the day of the Lord. Amos had warned them that they shouldn't be looking forward to the day of the Lord because it would be a day of darkness for them, not light. God doesn't live in the midst of an apostate people. He tells them, I am not your God and you are not my people. When Christians say don't judge the church and they treat the church as if it's still in the same condition that it was in when the apostles were leading it, they're not defending God's temple. They're doing what apostate people do when God tells them that he doesn't live with them. 
If the church today is rejecting the commands of God, living a life God hates, loving the world, thinking about themselves, loving money, and only giving God lip service, then they're dead. They're apostate. They are not the bride of Christ. They are not the temple of God. Paul calls them apostate. James calls them adulterers. Peter calls them dirty spots and blemishes. John calls them the Antichrist. Jude calls them twice dead. Jesus calls them dangerous wolves. They are describing Christians when they say these things. Were they taking a sledgehammer to the temple of God when they said these things? The apostate church is not the church. Paul said it's our job to judge the church. It's not attacking the temple of God. It's not speaking against the bride of Christ. It's our responsibility. It's our responsibility as people who love the temple of God and as people who love the bride of Christ. Why? Why is it our job to judge the church? Why is it our responsibility? Well, when Paul told us that we must judge the church, he explained why. You know the saying, just a little leaven makes the whole batch of dough rise. Take out all the old leaven so that you will be a new batch of dough without leaven, which you really are. He then talks about how we're supposed to judge the church. We'll come back to this in the next video. And he concludes, The scripture says you must remove the evil person among you. Why must we judge the church? Well, we talked about leaven in an earlier video. Leaven is basically yeast. You put it in bread dough and it spreads through the whole thing, changing the entire batch of dough, causing it to rise. Paul is saying, if you don't judge the church, apostasy will spread. It will spread through the whole thing. You have to get the leaven out. The reason we're supposed to judge the church is so that the church doesn't become apostate. It's to keep the church pure. If we're following what Jesus taught and recognizing who true Christians are and who they are not, then we won't start following other people into apostasy. Think of it this way. Imagine that you are on a narrow, difficult, painful road, and you look to your side and you see someone traveling in the same direction as you. Their road is easy, it's wide, it's paved. It seems like it would be a much easier trip. They say they're going to the same place you're going. They say their destination is the same as yours. If you believe them and you believe that their road will also take you to the same place, wouldn't you want to jump over to their road? Wouldn't you want to choose their path instead of the one you're on? This is what has happened in the church. Christians don't want to judge the church. They don't want to judge a tree by its fruit. They don't accept the gospel from scripture. They accept a gospel that says you're saved by what you think and believe to be true. Then they see people who call themselves Christians. They get a good career. They live a cushy life. They have a happy family. They enjoy all the things this life offers. They assume that those people are going to arrive at the same destination as them. Why? Because those people call themselves Christians and believe in Jesus. If you're accepting the wrong gospel, then you'll think that those people are saved too. And if they're going to arrive at the same destination, but they're going to have a much easier road to get there, then why wouldn't Christians jump over to their road? And the problem is so many Christians don't even realize that they've jumped over. They're just accepting the standard they see around them and they don't realize just how radical Jesus actually is. Paul corrected the Corinthians because they were still acting like normal, ordinary people. 
unless you are living in a way where people would think you are alien to this world, you haven't arrived yet. Christians don't accept what Jesus has to say about judging a tree by its fruit. They don't accept what John says about how to know for sure if someone else knows God. And the result is what we see all around us. Everyone's choosing the easy road. Everyone believes the easy road results in the same destination, so everyone is choosing it. The Bible is clear. Many will be deceived. The warnings in Scripture are not that these people will have less treasure when they get to heaven. The warnings are that these people are headed to destruction. They are apostate. Paul says they tolerate people who preach a different Jesus. They receive a different spirit and they accept a different gospel. In other words, they may say they believe in the gospel, they may say they believe in Jesus, and they may think they have the Spirit, but despite all of this, they are not actually Christians. If the gospel you believe is a different gospel than the one preached in the Bible, you're not saved. And if you're trusting in Jesus, but it's a different Jesus than the true Jesus of Scripture, you're not saved. And if you received a spirit, but it's a different spirit than the Spirit of God, whose temple are you? If Christians never learn how to judge a tree by its fruit, they will never learn how to stop following these people into apostasy. If Christians keep thinking all roads lead to heaven as long as you believe in Jesus, then they will typically choose the road that's most appealing to them. Brothers and sisters, if you love God, you will obey God. And you need to start recognizing that if others actually love God, they will be obeying Him too. This means that all those people who think they're going to the same place as you, they're not. Not unless they are also obeying the radical commands of Jesus that cost us everything. This is important to recognize because we need to stop allowing ourselves to accept their lifestyle. We need to choose the kingdom even when they wouldn't. We need to shine as a light to them because they're lost. They're wandering in the darkness like sheep without a shepherd. We need to show them what it means to be alive and not let them influence us. We need to be an unleavened batch of dough and not let their leaven get in and start to spread. So, we are supposed to recognize true Christians from false Christians based on their fruit. That fruit being whether or not they do what God wants. As John said, anyone who says, I know God, but does not obey his commands is a liar and the truth is not in that person. As we've seen throughout this series, the church today looks almost identical to Israel during their apostasy. The church today looks almost identical to the Pharisees during the time of Jesus. When God judged ancient Israel, Babylon tore the city to the ground. Hundreds of thousands of Israelites died. The temple was destroyed. The people were led away from the promised land into exile. When God judged Israel again shortly after Jesus, Rome burned the city to the ground. Millions of Israelites died. The temple was destroyed again. The survivors were sold into slavery and led into exile. The promised land was left desolate for thousands of years. So if the description of the church today perfectly matches the description of Israel right before God judged them with Babylon, or the Pharisees right before God judged them with Rome, pause for a second. 
Think really hard about the implications of that. What does that imply about the church today? Israel was called God's people too. They were called God's children. God had rescued them from slavery and brought them to the promised land. God led them through the wilderness. They held on to this history all the way through their apostasy, continuing to think that they were still God's children. The day before Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, the Israelites still thought God would never let his nation fall. They believed they were still his people. They didn't recognize that things had changed. The church today thinks the same way. They look at what happened in the early church. They look at what Jesus did. They look at the apostles. And they assume that the descriptions of the church in the Bible are the same descriptions of the church today. They call themselves God's children. They call themselves God's people. But they're not recognizing that God also called Israel his children. He also called them his people. But when they stopped obeying him, he told them, you are not my people. When they stopped obeying him, he told them that they were not his children. In Romans 11, Paul is talking about how Israel stopped obeying God and they were cut off. They were no longer his people. He was not their God. He rejected them. He says this, It is as if some of the branches from an olive tree have been broken off. You Gentiles are like the branch of a wild olive tree that has been grafted to that first tree. You now share the rich root of the first tree. So do not consider yourself superior to those branches that were broken off. If you brag, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. That is true. But those branches were broken off because they were unfaithful. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, then he will not spare you either. Notice that God is kind and also severe. He is severe toward those who stop following him. But God is kind to you if you continue following in his kindness. If you do not, you will also be cut off from the tree. And if the Jews do not continue in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. If you Gentiles were cut off from a wild olive tree and, contrary to nature, grafted into a good olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree again? In this section, Paul is talking about how Israel fell away from God. They were unfaithful to him. They didn't have pisties. They didn't have fidelity. And because of that, they were like branches cut off from a tree. The tree still stands. Israel still stands. But those who rejected God were cut off. But Paul gives a warning to us in the church age. If we don't continue in God's love, we will be cut off too. If we are unfaithful, we will be cut off too. That means that just like God told Israel, you are not my people and I am not your God, if the church does not continue in his love, then he will tell them, you are not my people and I am not your God. His standards haven't changed. He didn't lower the bar for us. Just like Israel thought they were God's people because they looked at all the amazing things God did for them and they were wrong, the church today looks at all the things God did in the early church and they think that they are still God's people because they look at what God did then. But if they are unfaithful, then they are branches that have been cut off. And just like the Jews, they don't realize they've been cut off. But anyone who repents and begins to walk in fidelity and faithfulness can be grafted back in, whether from the wild olive tree or from the good tree. This is a warning for us in the church age.
if you are unfaithful, you will be cut off. It doesn't matter if you think you're a Christian. It doesn't matter if you look at the history of the church and you think, wow, the church is God's people. If the church is unfaithful, they are branches that get cut off. Anyone who is unfaithful gets cut off. When we see Jesus interacting with the people of Israel, we need to understand that his interactions with the church today would look very similar because the church today looks just like them. The people of Israel said to Jesus, God is our father. He is the only father we have. Isn't that exactly what Christians today think and say? But Jesus replied to them, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to do what he wants. The person who belongs to God obeys the words of God, but you don't obey because you don't belong to God. Jesus called the people of Israel, God's people, he called them children of the devil. They thought they were God's children, but they were actually children of the devil. Why? because they didn't obey God's commands. And John says the same thing about Christians. He says, in this way, it is apparent who God's children are and who the devil's children are. Those who do not practice righteousness are not God's children. And those who do not love their brothers and sisters are not God's children. So according to Jesus and John, God's children are called children of the devil if they stop obeying God's commands. It was true of Israel, and it's true of the church. John the Baptist told the people of Israel, Do the things that prove your repentance. Don't begin to say to yourselves, Abraham is our father. For I tell you that God could raise up children for Abraham from these rocks. The axe is now ready to cut down the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Do you understand the implications for the church today? Israel had an amazing beginning. God rescued them. He held their hand and delivered them out of slavery. He called them His children. He called them His bride. Does that sound familiar? Just because the church had an amazing beginning doesn't mean that God is your father if you call yourself a Christian. Don't begin to say to yourselves, God is our father. For I tell you that God could raise up children for himself out of rocks. Do the things that prove your repentance, because the axe is now ready to cut down the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. The church today does not look like the early church. Christians today do not live the way they lived. They don't obey the commands of God that the early church was obeying. The church today looks like apostate Israel. It looks like the Pharisees. What are the implications of that for the church? What are the implications of that for your own life? Christians need to stop thinking of the church as everyone who believes in the information about Jesus and calls themselves Christians. Christians need to stop thinking that God views the church today the same way he did the early church, even though the church today looks nothing like the early church. God's children are those who obey him. Anyone who does not obey him is not his child. Anyone who does not obey him is a child of the devil. We can know who true Christians are by looking at how they live. Do they do the things God wants or do they reject his radical, extreme, costly commands? As we talked about earlier in this series, it's not just do they do things for God. 
Okay, the Pharisees did things for God. Apostate Israel did things for God. Lots of people think they're doing things for God. But are they doing what God said to do? Are they obeying His commands? Are they living the life we see in the book of Acts? Unless their lives look like what we read in Acts, they're not doing what God said to do. Unless they're sharing everything in common, they're not doing what God said to do. Unless they are looking out for the needs of others above their own, they're not doing what God said to do. Unless they're selling their possessions and giving to the brothers and sisters around them, they're not doing what God said to do. Unless they are living in equality where everyone is equal and no one has more than they need and no one has less, unless they're doing that, they're not living the way God said to live. They're not doing what God said to do. We have God's commands in Scripture. We can know what God wants. If we know what God wants, we can see if people are living the way God wants. And if we can see if they're obeying Him, then we can know who is a real Christian and who is not. So then the only question is, what do we do about it? And that's what we're going to look at in our next video.